Thanks everyone for uh, coming to the uh, ESE PhD Student Colloquium. Uh, we have a, a great speaker today. Uh, Avik uh, Day did his uh, undergraduate uh, uh, degrees in uh, applied math and mechanical engineering at uh, Johns Hopkins, and then he uh, stuck around for a master's before uh, coming to uh, Penn to uh, start his PhD uh, in ESE, where he's been working with uh, Dan Kodacek. So today he's going to be presenting some of his uh, uh, recent work in uh, in uh, robotics and dynamical systems. So, uh, Abhik, I'll let you take the floor. Yeah, thanks, Alec. Yeah, that, that was a uh, more introduction than I've ever had in my life. So, um, you've covered all of my accomplishments and degrees. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, thanks uh, for being here. Um, so, the first thing I did is I changed the title from what it was before, uh, mostly because the, the, the title before was for a shorter talk I had given earlier this summer, and this talk is a slightly expanded version. Um, so I'm going to tell you what all of these things mean. Uh, maybe some people already know what those mean, but basically the, the talk is going to address the goal of uh, building up robot behaviors from uh, simpler primitives in a way that's useful to legged robots. Okay, so I'll go over an outline quickly just to make sure um, you know, I, I cover uh, everything that's you know, relevant here. Um, so first I'm going to talk about some hardware advancements. So this is mostly you know, just to set the stage kind of to, to show you what kind of robots these experiments are going to be on. And when I say a robot name, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, the second part, uh, so I should mention, by the way, a lot of the first part I worked on with Gavin Keneally, who is here today in the audience. But uh, in the future, maybe he'll give a talk here so he can talk about more of this stuff. Um, uh, and so, so, the, so the meat of the talk, I guess, is uh, thinking of uh, build, building up robot behavior. So when we say modularity, uh, uh, there's an image in our mind of you know, interconnecting little blocks. And uh, mostly the important thing in that picture is that we're trying to construct uh, more complicated systems from simpler constituents. So this is pretty easy to imagine when you're thinking of uh, kind of modular uh, hardware, like uh, you know, uh, modular robots what we think of as modular robots, but um, I, I'm especially interested in thinking about modularity and behavior. Uh, so not just the hardware pieces, but also how to think about um, the, 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 the full, uh, the behavior of the robot as being constructed out of simpler primitives. So there are some ideas of this, um, some of which are mature and most of which are not so mature. Um, so this is, you know, pe people don't usually, this is not a very conventional way to think about uh, creating behaviors in robotics. Typically, you know, one approach you might take is thinking of modeling the entire system, and uh, uh, that system may, may have, you know, 10 degrees of freedom, uh, 20 dimensions, uh, and then uh, coming up with a, an algorithm or some kind of control strategy that controls the whole system. But I'm kind of thinking about how you uh, construct the, the control strategy out of simpler primitives. And so, uh, obviously, there are some, some notions that we need to introduce. Um, so, the, so the three notions that are kind of uh, important here um, are, the, are, are sequential, parallel, and uh, what I'm calling symbolic, but that one's kind of up in there still. So sequential mean, means that uh, we're going to chain together behavior. So this is a very simple idea of, you know, you want your robot to do one thing now and another thing, you know, in, in two minutes from now. And uh, so that's, that's what we're going to think of as sequential composition. Parallel composition is when you want your robot to do two things at the same time. Um, and symbolic is to, uh, you know, is, is, is a kind of much more abstracted version of the sequential idea, which I'll explain with, uh, with actual examples. Okay, so I'll start off with hardware. Um, so the hardware in legged robots, kind of the genesis of the interesting hardware that inspired us is uh, Mark Rebert's work. So he, here's one of Rebert's planar hoppers. So you can see it's bouncing around. This was in the year 1986, so quite a long time ago. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about, uh, so, so, so the, the thing that made all of these behaviors possible is that um, there, there's a, uh, Mark Raber cleverly kind of eliminated all the constraints on, uh, you know, force and power density by uh, plugging the robot into the, uh, into the wall, essentially, and giving it um, a huge power source so that you could focus more on the interesting parts uh, like control. Um, but obviously, we want to take these robots outside. Um, so Martin Bueller was one of Dan's earlier students. So this robot, similarly kind of bouncy, uh, uh, is called Scout. Um, it's a bounding robot that Martin Bueller built. And uh, um, so this robot, the, the, uh, 
identification that he made is that to take these robots outside, you need to really kind of uh, uh, make sure that the, the power source is commensurate with the power requirements. And uh, that led to de the development of Scout and, and later Rex, which is a robot that you would have seen around Penn. So Rex um, is a robot that can uh, kind of uh, uh, auto power autonomously run over rough terrain at uh, pretty good speeds. Um, but the problem with Rex that kind of motivated more work in this area is that it's very good at kind of exerting forces on the ground, but it's very bad at feeling forces from the ground, mostly because, um, because of uh, things like gearing and ser unmodeled series elasticity, which I'll kind of briefly go over. Um, from the other uh, aspect, so there, there was a lot of work on direct drive manipulation uh, platforms by Harry Asada. So here's a, a picture of an arm, and there were several um, iterations of a direct drive arm at MIT. Um, Ken Salisbury, he made the, uh, the Phantom, or, or, or sorry, uh, he made uh, these haptic devices, which were cable driven and have all the properties that we want of being able to perceive uh, forces from the environment or your hand. Um, but the problem is, you know, the, the cables are kind of messy, and, uh, um, and the power and force are also kind of limited. So we took all these lessons, and um, so uh, Sangbei Kim, I guess, took all of these lessons and uh, constructed this robot, the MIT Cheetah, which you might have seen. So he gave a talk here recently. Um, this robot kind of uh, does a lot of both. So there, you can have access to high forces, but also uh, be kind of nimble and uh, um, good at feeling forces from the world. Um, so we've taken kind of all of these ideas and uh, uh, kind of uh, pushed the idea of uh, getting rid of the uh, obstructions to transparency, these gearboxes, to the extreme and gotten rid of gears um, completely. So, th so um, Gavin uh, built this leg, which is uh, 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 probably one of the only kind of legged things that you'll see that doesn't have a gearbox at all. So this is difficult to do for a number of reasons, which we've explored. Um, but essentially, um, all of the robots that I'm going to talk about have this uh, direct drive uh, infrastructure in use. Um, I'll quickly go over the robots. Um, so there are some lessons about the motors that we learned. Specifically, you want motors that are wider and bigger. So, so the picture up top kind of shows you the idea here. I'm not going to go too much into the details. Uh, we've also optimized things like the leg design, um, the construction of the robot so that um, you know, we're not wasting things on uh, structural uh, framing uh, and instead devoting a large percent of the mass of the robot to just the motors. Um, and we want a high level of uh, control bandwidth. So you know, the, the, the Rex paradigm where um, you can have slow signals descending from the brain to the legs, um, kind of similar. But that was inspired by cockroaches. So we're kind of throwing that out a little bit and uh, making sure we can uh, have a high rate of control um, from feeling forces from the world to exerting them. Um, so so the, the robot specifically, so here this robot is called Jerboa. Um, it's kind of an interesting morphology with two legs and a tail. So the tail has two degrees of freedom, although that won't really show up in this talk. Um, so I guess I'll point out here that the, the hips, so the, the angle of the legs is actuated, but the extension of the legs isn't. It's just a passive spring. And the tail is actuated in a kind of a revolute, revolute manner. So here's some uh, quick videos of Jerboa just to kind of show you what the machine looks like. So here it was jumping on top of a block, and here it's uh, turning around using its tail. Um, so, so, the, um, so the robot is uh, you know, agile in some sense of, the, of that word, uh, just on the basis of having kind of small inertia and motors capable of giving it fairly large accelerations quickly. Uh, this robot is called the Delta Hopper. It's uh, got three motors, which are all connected in parallel to a single toe, so it's a one-legged robot. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. And the, uh, the, the last robot that I'm going to talk about is Minotaur, which is a quadruped built using uh, two motors per leg. So each leg can actively extend and also uh, swing. All right. OK, so now, so now that I've kind of set the stage with the hardware, so the, the, the parts of the talk that I wanted to focus on is kind of, uh, so th this is at the highest level. So when you want to program behaviors, uh, I was talking about the three kind of building blocks. And here I'll actually show you some example videos without explaining exactly what's going on, but just to give you an intuitive idea for what I mean by the different types of compositions. So here's Jerboa, again, doing this leaping thing. Um, where 
uh, the first step it took, the first uh, leap kind of uh, is, a, is just setting the stage for the second leap where um, the robot is kind of bouncing off its springy legs. And then uh, after that, the tail kind of bumps against the ground to correct the body pitch. So there, there are a lot of things happening in sequence. And there's actually a very good formalism for thinking about how to construct behaviors like this. Um, so here's a cartoon. Uh, uh, which shows a sequence of funnels. So uh, many of you have probably seen this before, but the idea of sequential composition is that um, each of your constituent behaviors you can think of as an energy basin. So if you think about each uh, part of that you saw as being kind of minimizing some kind of cost or energy, um, that's kind of bringing you downward into this funnel, and you, you just have to set up the system so that each funnel exits into the entrance of a second funnel. So you can kind of chain them together and uh, get to the end of your behavior. So that's the idea of sequential composition. And um, this isn't my idea. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a very old idea. And, and uh, um, it has probably the most formalism out of anything I'll talk about today. Um, but it's certainly it's one way, one important building block to composing behaviors. Um, the second idea, so this, so this robot, um, this is actually my, my work. So this robot is uh, hopping up and down. Um, and it's also kind of moving forward. So, so the, uh, the, the thing I mentioned before, of wanting your robot to do two things at once, so the two things here are hopping up and down and moving to the left. And obviously, the robot has to do both because um, you know, it can't slide to the left without hopping up and down just because of the nature of the legged robot. So this idea is parallel composition. And uh, I'm beginning to get some formalism um, for this, which I'll talk about briefly later. And the last idea is, again, this leaping. But now, instead of uh, having the multiple steps, I kind of wanted to zoom in on one part where um, the robot is kind of just getting off the ground and on top of this box. And you can see that it's messy and very complicated. So, th so the legs make contact with the ground. Uh, I'll play that again. Oops. The legs make contact with the ground. The tail makes contact with the ground. The legs leave, uh, break contact with the ground then the tail breaks contact with the ground. There's a lot of stuff happening inside that you know, 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds or whatever that was. Um, and uh, we don't quite know how to analyze behaviors that are you know, seemingly simple, but actually, in, in terms of if you wanted to do the analysis of this, it would be quite difficult. Um, and all uh, we're doing so far is kind of thinking about this in a kind of symbolic uh, way, where um, each of those contact states is kind of uh, a node in this graph, which is called the ground reaction complex. Um, well, it's a graph if you think about uh, only thinking about certain dimensions of it. But essentially, we think of all of these contact modes as letters, which can be chained together to form words. So that's the last kind of composition, which is the least understood. So I'll talk about that only briefly. All right. So the the um, the sequential composition, I, I'll skip kind of the formalism just because it's uh, not my work, but I'll move straight on to the parallel composition and show you some, some of the ideas there. Um, so to, to think about com or uh, synthesizing co complicated behaviors, there's some prior art here. Um, the most relevant um, kind of way of thinking about complicated systems and their relation to simpler primitives is this template anchor relation that was a uh, 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 suggested by Bob Full and Dan Kotacek. Um, so the, uh, this is mostly an analytical uh, point of view where you kind of take a system, like a robot or an animal, and uh, try to determine if, it, if there's some um, idea of a simpler system embedded in a complicated system. So the idea, very, very briefly, is that so the simpler system, which is called the template, so the F sub T is the template uh, system, essentially exist within a restriction of the complicated system, which is called the anchor, or F sub A. So this is uh, essentially the idea. It's very simple um, to kind of imagine what's going on. It just means that the complicated system, when restricted to some part of its dynamics, acts like the template system. So it's just relation between closed loop systems. It's good for analysis, so you can kind of look at a robot, uh, you know, evaluate these expressions, and uh, see if this conjugacy exists, or for an animal. Um, but the problem is that um, th this step, the, the green box step, the going from the template to the anchor is not as well understood using um, this view. Um, so, so let's propose a synthetic view. Um, and I'll do that with a specific example. So here's a vertical, hop, vertical hopper. So you can think about it as a, as a spring and a mass that's kind of bouncing up and down. It has some 
uh, dynamical sort of uh, input uh, dynamical system. So this is a plant model. So a U is the input and X is the state here. Um, and typically, I'll, we'll put in a feedback controller. So this U is now a function of the state. And it will result in some closed loop uh, 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 dynamical system X dot equals F of X. And, and notice that you know that F sub T1 is supposed to be similar to the F sub T that uh, we saw before. So now let's say I want to embed this vertical hopping system in my robot, which can go up and down, but also sideways. So, so what is the procedure to do that? So the, the complicated system has its own corresponding dynamics and um, its own way in which the inputs enter into it. But the, so the question is, what is, what is this input? What should I make the control input for this complicated system such that the behavior of the simpler system is recovered? So ideally, um, we'd be very, very happy if this were true. So, the, so the, this idea is that um, I'm just going to use the controller of the, uh, of the vertical hopper, which is D sub T1, um, on, on whatever states are relevant. So that pi is a projection. And then apply, apply this controller to the, to the, the complicated system. So, so, so this is this is it. This is the uh, the idea is really the simplest. So we'll uh, have a map to map controllers from template to anchor. But the the, the second thing we want is that uh, we'll, well, we want to embed multiple templates in the same anchor. So so this robot that can pop up and down but also go sideways. Um, you can think of that the hopping sideways as having a, a corresponding template plant. So so we like to think about that as a, a rolling uh, rimless wheel. Um, since uh, that has the same properties of you know settling down to a constant speed, um, and so ideally what we'd like is that to you know we know some control input for the rimless wheel, and ideally we'd like to apply that together with the uh, controller for the vertical hopper in kind of their own decoupled ways, and uh, see if the behavior is uh, really the cross product of the rimless wheel and the vertical hopper. So the second. Uh, Second uh, bullet point here is that we want to anchor multiple templates simultaneously. And this is what um, I'm going to be calling parallel composition. Um, and, uh, and we want to, of course, find sufficient con conditions under which this works. So the sufficient conditions part, so checking that this works, is obviously a huge part of this. So you'll um, obviously be wondering, why would this be true? Well, um, so I'm actually not going to spend that much time talking about that, just because um, it's uh, messy. And uh, it's, it's, I mean, of course, that's, that's uh, very important, but it's, uh, um, I'd rather focus on the more exciting parts of what you get if you can do this. But I will talk about that for two slides for people who are you know, really burning to know. Um, OK, so, so, so the, the key point here is that if you can do this, like I said, um, the conditions will come, in, come soon. But if you can do this, then there's a notion of modularity you get in behavior that's uh, very, very um, helpful. So and I, I just want to give some examples of how that appears. Um, so here's the first way that appears. So, so let's say I have that vertical hopping template that I talked about before, and I know how to implement that. So the, the, the useful thing is that I can now implement that vertical hopper template on several different kinds of robots and, and hopefully get a vertical hopping behavior on all of them. So here's the uh, cartoon of the template. and. Um, the idea, essentially, for my controller is that I have to restore the momentum that's lost to gravity. And you can, as you can imagine, there are several ways to do that. I can add a constant force. It can be a spring law. It can be several things. So yeah, a physical spring doesn't actually need to be there. If you just have a force actuator acting on the ground, you can uh, apply arbitrary forces. So here's one example of this vertical hopper. Um, this is a video, again, from Raybert. And uh, here's this planar hopper which is kind of uh, just exerting a thrust on the ground when it detects that it's at bottom, and uh, it's able to hop up and down. So this is uh, another video from Raybert's uh, lab. This is uh, the Uniru, Uniru by Zeglin. And you can see that this robot, the leg is much more complicated. It's articulated. There's even a tail, which is actually not that important to this video. But um, you can see that it's hopping up and down in much the same way. And the control idea, um, if you go back and read these papers, is, is exactly the same. So at, when the robot detects it's at bottom, it kind of there's a fixed thrust that's applied at the knee joint, and the robot is able to hop up and down. Um, I have my own way of thinking about the vertical hopper, which is kind of less of a force injection and more of a smooth thing, um, which I call active damping, and that has kind of analytically simpler properties. Um, 
And so we can also implement something like that on the robots here. So this is the Delta Hopper, um, and that's Mitch Fogelson, my undergraduate uh, mentee, uh, who was able to make this robot hop, in, hop up and down without too much effort. So you <coughs> see that it's quite energetic. And uh, uh, it's not actually controlling its sideways or its uh, lateral position at all, but it's able to hop up and down. Um, and lastly, here's, here's Jerboa. And you can see that it's also hopping up and down using a control law that's uh, very similar. But this robot, it doesn't, the leg doesn't even have a way to push down. So the, the way this robot is hopping up and down is that it's using its tail actuator to swing the tail mass um, against the leg spring um, to, to essentially add energy to the leg spring. So the, the physical mechanism and the physical body in all of these examples are quite different. Um, but the resulting behavior, you can see that it, it, it's very similar. So all of these bodies are hopping up and down um, without paying attention to the specific equations of motion, the parameters, the models, any, any of that. Um, so here's my second example. So the second template that's interesting is the one that um, is the rimless wheel, where uh, you can imagine that this, uh, 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 this thing without uh, rim, when it's rolling down the hill, eventually it gets to a steady state speed, mostly because so the impacts cause it to lose energy and gravity causes it to gain energy, and there's some happy medium in the middle where it uh, rolls down at a fixed speed. So that's the kind of model underlying uh, thinking of how we want to uh, have our robots out forward. Um, so I, I, so yeah, so this is how I think about my uh, uh, controllers for controlling forward speed, but usually they're implemented um, by using uh, um, a, st a stepping idea where the, the leg angle is picked such that, um, such that the forward momentum is balanced with the vertical momentum. Um, so okay, so, so here's an example of that acting. So the, in the previous slide, you saw Jerbo hopping up and down. And here, all it's doing, in addition to that controller, um, is it's running a controller where the uh, leg angle in flight is uh, is picked as a is a particular function of the current forward speed, and that um, is a relatively small change to the code, and it's completely it doesn't affect the vertical controller. And here, this robot is able to happily hop forward. Um, the same controller again, where uh, we're just picking the stepping angle um, in flight, is also able to make this robot, the quadrupedal robot Minotaur, bound forward. And lastly, um, this video should be playing. Um, it's also able to make this robot prong forward. So this is a, a different condition, so that the vertical controller and the pitch controller are different, but uh, the robot's happily able to control its forward speed slightly less fast than the bounding, but uh, all the same. Uh, you get very similar uh, kind of forward forward uh, motion out of it. So again, all of these the, these three videos were different behaviors and or very different morphologies, um, but the idea behind the control uh, the is is exactly the same. And the last last template that I'll talk about is controlling uh, essentially what we think of as balance. So if uh, my body angles need to be stabilized in some way to prevent me from falling over. And uh, uh, so, so the, the idea behind this is that if you have an available torque, which is that red arrow, you can essentially uh, apply torques to, uh, against the angles. So essentially, the body inertia comes into this in some way. So here's, here's a one uh, implementation of this. Minotaur, with, when four legs touch the ground, it's able to apply differential uh, extension forces, essentially, to uh, control its roll and pitch angle. So here, the robot is just kind of jumping up and down. Um, another less less uh, obvious example is that when the if you think about Minotaur in the um, horizontal plane, so a top-down view, uh, the legs can exert uh, kind of differential angle uh, uh, forces or torques, uh, hip torques, to apply moments on the body in the horizontal plane, and so it's able to control its facing or uh, the the yaw angle. And the last kind of unconventional example here is that. Um, if I take this first video and add a bias to the desired roll angle, I can make this robot kind of do this uh, uh, lateral motion, even though it has no actuators out of the sagittal plane. Um, and lastly, so even though my ideas of this uh, uh, balance control template are very simple, where I'm just thinking about applying a force or applying a torque against the angle uh, degrees of freedom, there are much more complicated ideas of balance control that exist in the literature. 
um, which uh, could also be introduced in the same way. The balance control? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, Rex. Um, uh, so so the, the the main way in which this torque, the torque, the red arrow is coming into play in Minotaur, is through uh, extension leg forces. So in this first video, uh, essentially there are differential extension forces in the front and the back, and the left and the right, controlling its attitude. But in Rex. Uh, those aren't available. There aren't any actuators that can actively control um, uh, those extension forces, so it's kind of hard to implement this. A very complicated kind of uh, modeling might uh, allow you to determine when the, the Rex hip torques um, give you these forces that you need, um, but that's, yeah, that's much more complicated than it's worth it. Okay, so now that I've talked about how, you know, having a library of simple templates can give you behaviors that uh, uh, affect a lot of bodies. I'm going to go back and talk about the reverse direction, where now we think about the same body having different uh, templates embedded within it. So here's Jerbo again. Um, so this is a, a, a simulation animation of something you've seen before, where it's uh, using its tail to pump energy into the leg spring and bouncing up and down. But, but so, the, so the end result here is that it's hopping forward. Um, but there's actually a different way, and here's a video of the same behavior which you've seen before. Um, but there's actually a different way in, this, uh, in which uh, uh, you can get the body hopping forward. Um, here what's happening is that the hip is exerting uh, a torx, to, uh, which essentially gives it a projection in the vertical direction. So this is essentially how Rex works, where Rex doesn't have an extension actuator, and the hips recirculating essentially give it some amount of vertical force to bounce up and down. And this robot can do that as well. So I have a video of it working in a slightly different way here, where so you can see that the hip actuators are kind of uh, rotating and really adding the energy to the motion, and the tail is just poking against the ground to keep the body balanced. Um, so these are, yeah, again, so uh, the, the end result is the same, but there are different, quite different ways to, to attain it. So essentially, a, a good way to think about this is that there are alternate solutions for getting the same behavior. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, you know, one of these is good when uh, you don't have a lot of traction because the hip isn't exerting a lot of uh, uh, hip torques, and the other one seems faster. So having these alternate solutions um, you can think of as being, uh, you know, just, just having some redundancy in case you're in a situation where, you know, Jerbo is on ice or something, and then you'd really prefer this one. Um, and, and, and there's a very uh, clean way of thinking about this. Um, and uh, I've shown you already Minotaur doing bounding and pronking. Um, uh, and uh, if you're wondering how the bounding and pronking comes about, I, uh, I won't delve into the details here, but I'll give you a quick idea. Um, so when Minotaur is bounding, it's essentially thinking of its front and rear as being independent vertical hoppers, and they kind of just bounce up and down, and that uh, makes Minotaur bound, and uh, applying the appropriate speed controllers can make it bound forward. And, but in, in terms of pronking, the approach is different, where we want to really constrain the pitch. So the vertical hoppers can't really be independent. Um, there has to be an active synchronization of the front and back phases so that the robot is bouncing up and down instead of alternating. Um, so so the, the, issue, the, the thing I want to highlight is that um, by using this kind of uh, uh, restricted set of controllers where they're really decoupled and uh, um, you know, we're searching from a much smaller space of controllers than is actually available, uh, we get this ability to reuse. Um, so the bounding and the pronking had the same vertical controllers, had the same four half stepping controllers, and by reusing these, we get to even generate new behaviors without having to kind of go back to the, go back to square one and start over with modeling and uh, whatever tool we might use to develop the controllers. Um, the last thing that you can get by, you know, quickly, so an example of generate is that, so Minotaur was doing this bounding and pronking, and one day we thought, why not just add a bunch of vertical energy for one step, and then you get these very, very primitive leaping behaviors. So here's Minotaur uh, kind of doing its pronking in place, and then uh, just for one step, uh, you goose the, or you uh, really uh, 
add a lot of as much vertical energy as possible. And you can see it can jump quite high um, without even having to do any other controller development. Uh, so there's Turner, who's uh, the his knee is the kind of the uh, the the metric for how Minotaur can how high Minotaur can jump. Um, and you can do the same thing while it's bounding. So here now it's uh, bounding forward and. Uh, you can do the same thing where you just arbitrarily add energy to one of the steps and can do a nice bound leap or a prong leap. Uh, so all of these, you know, are, they took about five minutes of work, which is kind of what I want to emphasize. Um, we, you know, spent the, I spent the five minutes writing the code, and uh, we spent the remainder of the time trying to make it do high jumps or lo long jumps or hurdles, and none of those worked. But at least you can see that the behaviors um, exist and are very easy to attain. Um, okay, so, so this is the kind of the business end of this. So now that I've shown you that this is desirable, that you might want to have this kind of modularity, um, the question obviously is when can you get it? And that's a more difficult question to answer, which I'm working on now. So I'll give you some flavor of the answer there. So when we think about what we want, the correctness uh, condition here would be that uh, the limit of the composition, so the, you know, the, the, the limiting behavior of Jerboa, is the, is the product of the limiting behavior of the template systems. So that's kind of obvious, but it's a difficult condition. So there's a stronger statement um, that, uh, that the composed system, Jerboa, or the slip in this example, is really dynamically conjugate to a kind of a diagonal cross product of these sim simple, simpler systems. Um, so those statements aren't exactly equivalent, but you know, uh, more or less, they're uh, of similar flavors or similar orders of magnitude, or I get yeah, similar uh, similar flavors of strength. So both of these conditions are kind of difficult to attain. Um, so the 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 uh, the formulation of uh, templates and anchors actually uh, is comes pretty close to uh, you know knowing when to answer that question. It's it's basically uh, the the statement becomes that the composed system anchors each of these templates. Um, uh, simultaneously. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that this condition, yeah? Can you put that in the case of a complex Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so, uh, so it's very hard to uh, attain in practice, but if you pardon me just using this example, even though I, it doesn't work in this example, but um, so, so the, if it did work in this example, what, what you'd get is that the, if you write down the equations of motion for slip, so you have an x dot equals f of x, you essentially see that there was an x1 and an x2 where um, x1 dot was essentially only a function of x1 and x2 dot is only a function of x2. And so it's kind of a diagonal decoupled system. Uh, but that, that doesn't happen. It, it won't happen in slip. It's uh, not possible. Um, but, but if that happened, then you'd, re you'd really know that the two systems are kind of evolving separately, because x1 only depends on x1. And the limit of the x1 system would re really be, or the x1 components of the composed system would really be kind of what the x1 system on its own would have gotten to. So, so you'd, you'd have gotten the first two sentences there um, if that were true, but it's usually not true. Um, so, so what I'm suggesting here is trying to think of a re relaxation of the systems, uh, uh, which is essentially an averaging approximation. I'll talk about averaging a little bit, but essentially the idea is that if you relax this condition a little bit, instead of thinking about uh, uh, conjugacy of the product, you think about conjugacy of the, the averaged approximation of the product. Um, so here's a cartoon. Uh, um, so, so the classical notion of averaging or sorry, the classical notion of anchoring is that um, the system evolving looks like the red line, where uh, uh, all of the, the flow kind of is trying to collapse onto a smaller dimensional uh, submanifold, um, and the blue line is really the template. So, so the, remember when I uh, was writing that equation before that a restriction of the anchor dynamics recovers the template. So yeah, the, the, a restriction of the red dynamics onto that blue subset would be essentially uh, that statement. But instead, what I'm thinking of is that forget um, exactly what the, uh, what the red and blue systems are, but instead kind of average over the, over the continuous uh, time evolution of the system. And then even if the red line is wiggling a lot, um, as long as the average behavior over um, some time scale uh, resembles the template, that's good enough. So uh, this approximation, while it seems arbitrary, 
um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, classical dynamical systems theory on averaging, which shows you that um, average systems actually recover the asymptotic properties of non-average systems, um, which is exactly kind of what we want if we want to prove stability. So, so it might be useful. Um, so uh, we can do this. So I've taken this vertical hopper system as a very, very basic example. Um, and uh, essentially, I've uh, uh, you know, plotted just this vertical hopping system. The first uh, plot is height. The second plot is kind of the, the energy uh, of the system. And you can see that it's trying to attain you know, a fixed energy level. And the interesting thing here is that um, what averaging lets us do is it lets us look at this complicated blue line, which is you know wiggling, and there's a jump in flight in flight phase. And essentially, that what the average system does is, if you do the algebra, it recovers this red system, which you can see essentially has just smoothed out all of the wiggly blue dynamics, and it's also kind of gotten rid of the reset part in flight. And essentially, it lets me think about this complicated hybrid system as a this, this red line, if you get rid of these dashed parts, essentially is an LTI system with a uh, very simple um, system evolution. You know, you can, you can see the first order exponential here. Um, so, so that's the kind of approximation. And, and obviously, the, you can see the resemblance in the evolution of the blue system and the red systems. And the red system was much easier to analyze. So that's the kind of thing we're looking to exploit. Um, an example of this that we have worked out for, you know, a, with a lot of assumptions is uh, Jerboa with pitch constraint. Um, so here's the, the, here are the two templates that we're looking for. And uh, uh, Jerboa, and I've gotten rid of the body because we're constraining the pitch with the boom here. Um, the two templates we're looking for are the vertical hopping and the rolling forward. Um, so the assumption, there are a lot of assumptions. So the, the first assumption is that we ignore gravity just to kind of make the problem simpler. And we also get rid of, um, and that lets us ignore the leg angle coordinates. So um, that simplifies, the, that reduces the dimension of the problem. And we also get rid of the tail angle because the tail is essentially acting as a kind of cascade um, from the tail torque to the tail angle and the, from the tail angle to the body. So. Uh, we kind of, since we don't really care about what the tail angle is in the limiting, in the limit, we get rid of it, and we're really looking for the center of mass behavior. And with all these assumptions and uh, uh, averaging, uh, we find that the average dynamics decouple in this case, um, just like I was telling you. Instead of the actual dynamics, the average dynamics decouple, and uh, it and and it ends up being conjugate to the average templates. So this is, you know, one of the first proofs that I did that um, tried to use this technique. Um, and to, to add on to that um, particular paper here is Jerboa with its pitch locked. And, uh, you know, it's, it's doing something you've seen before. It's kind of hopping up and down. And we uh, examined um, how well the templates are in there by kind of looking at, you know, kind of zooming out and looking at uh, plots of forward displacement with time. And, you know, we can control the speed, as you can see. Uh, and we can also con control the height. Um, it's a, hard, a little hard to see the height versus time plots on the right, just because the data dropped out a bunch. But you can see that the height changes at somewhere in the middle of all of these plots, showing that it is indeed controllable. Um, and, and, and while the proof was very conservative, a lot of the conditions for the proof aren't true. For, for, for certainly, gravity exists in the robot um, experiments. We haven't gotten rid of it. So the, so the question is how well uh, from robot data or you know, from, from a more accurate simulation, how, how well does the averaging approximation actually, does it actually make sense even if you add back gravity and uh, you know, all of the, approximation, the assumptions that we made? And it looks, looks like it does. So um, here, are the, um, sorry. So here are the plots are of uh, a, a very simple template system. Uh, the red is the average system, and the blue is the wiggly system. And in, in a lot of respects, the wiggly system does resemble the average system. And uh, we see some of this from the real data as well. Although uh, this is, yeah, definitely not a quantitative analysis, much less a proof. Um, but it's at least you know, going in that direction. OK, so now that I've talked about modularity or the advantages of modularity, and you know, I've told you a little bit about the conditions for correctness, uh, what, what, what are the compromises that we have to make to do this? So firstly, um, you have to make design compromises. So this is very interesting because it's usually very hard to get conditions on, you know, 
uh, that tell you, your, oh, your robot design is bad, you should improve it in this way. That's usually not something that analysis can tell you. But uh, just by trying to use these decoupled controllers, it's actually kind of, you can make logical conclusions about what you should improve in your design. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So here is Delta Hopper, uh, hopping, and I showed you a video of it hopping up and down, and I'll quickly play it again. Um, so in this video, uh, what I didn't tell you before is that the pitch is constrained by the boom again, just like Jerbo, in Jerbo in the previous slide. Um, so when, uh, when Delta Hopper tries to control its pitch, unfortunately, um, the toe mass plays a very, very significant effect on the uh, stepping control, just because swinging the toe completely uh, makes the body very unbalanced just because of the, you can imagine if you swing a massy toe, it'll it exert a counter moment on the body and that completely screws up the, uh, the attitude control. And so the, the goal we had uh, of having decoupled controllers so that the, the toe movement for speed didn't have to care about the balance, that doesn't really work in this example. And the conclusion is that um, you should design your robot so that the toe is very light so that these controllers don't interact. Um, so yeah, so the, the obvious thing we did was uh, glue that on the body to make its inertia much bigger. Or not glue, but you know, bolt that on the body. And uh, you can see that Mark Rebert actually did the same thing if you look at his book. Um, so there's a, something called a balance beam on the robot, and it even has weights on the end to try and increase the inertia of the body. Um, the, the second example is that you know, in Jerboa, we had to have a tail that's... Uh, so the tail has to have inertia, but we don't want it to have too much mass, just because the, then the center of mass of the robot keeps shifting backward. Um, and ideally, in the limit, you want to have a tail that weighs nothing, but has a lot of inertia. So that's not possible, so we compromise by having a light tail um, that's long. Um, and the more subtle thing is that, you know, uh, uh, we've sacrificed some in design, but really the thing that's harder to measure is that we have we sacrificed performance. So here's a, um, you know, a, a very kind of a, not not meant to be a comparison, but just an illustration that Minotaur um, is you know running at some speed with these uh, this modular control architecture, but it's definitely not as fast as, uh, uh, for instance, a, a different robot, the MIT Cheetah. So how much of that is the fault of the my uh, you know, restricting the set of controllers that I'm able to use here. So that's a question that's very hard to answer, and uh, 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 that's definitely uh, something that's up for uh, debate. Okay, so so that was the talk about modularity. So within the last, I guess, ten minutes, I'll try to, or maybe five minutes. I don't know how long usually I'm supposed to. How long am I supposed to go? All right. So okay. So the, I, I spend most of my time talking about the, the parallel compositions, just because that's what I have worked most on. So I will quickly talk about some work uh, I did with Anna Brill, who is an undergraduate. Um, so this was the work on the symbolic compositions, where um, these are the messy leaping behaviors that we it, they're very difficult to analyze. So what we do is we resort to much more much cruder approximation here or abstraction. Um, so here's the motivating picture. Um, so here are Rex and Jerboa, and the red and, or sorry, the cyan and magenta dots are meant to be contact. So the, those are the points of which the body or the leg or the tail can touch the ground, and the the cyan dots are the active contacts, the one which are, you know, they're they're actually making contact with the ground. So what we did in the, these two experiments is that we sent the legs, so the leg of Jerboa and the leg of Rex, and the tail of Jerboa and the hind leg of Rex, the same commands. And look, look that they, they make the same jump, even though the bodies are quite different. The, you know, the tail and the leg are attached to the same point on the jerboa in this plane, but they're you know, attached to different points on Rex. Rex weighs about five times as much, but, but they produce a similar looking leap. So why, why is this, and when will this happen? Um, so that's an interesting question. So that, that was mostly the motivation behind this work. Um, so the abstraction that we choose to use here is called the ground reaction complex. So the ground reaction complex is, uh, again, the nodes are, um, or sorry, the nodes and the, the, all of the cells, I guess, the faces and the edges, they're all uh, different contact nodes. So the uh, binary strings here kind of represent which contacts are active, one being active, zero being not active. 
where the full string represents all the possible contacts. So um, I'll use this example to kind of illustrate. So here's a, a, a Jerboa without a tail, which is the first model we looked at, which has three possible contacts, so body, body, and leg. And so the string is of length three, and one is where each of these contacts are active. You can see you get this kind of grand reaction complex. So this, this abstraction, um, as I was saying, is much cruder, uh, mostly because we've lost any notion of dynamics here. So we've kind of um, taken snapshots of the robot, and this is just in the configuration space. So obviously, there's no dynamics on this complex. And uh, so that's kind of the sacrifice we have to make to kind of try to simplify and get some traction on this problem. Um, so leaping, in particular, becomes kind of a sequence through this cell complex where you start with the body touching the ground um, and none of the limbs. And the goal is to get to this stage where the robot is airborne. None of the contacts are active. Um, and uh, obviously, you can see that they're you know, logical um, constraints you can't, or and dynamic constraints, so you can't directly levitate from the body on the ground to the body in the air. You have to take some sequence of, uh, or so, some path through this complex, um, uh, which we call a, a leap, essentially. So leaps are words, and uh, each of these nodes are letters. So if you think about an analogy to some kind of grammar or something, so we're starting from letters and composing words from them. Uh, yeah. So essentially, this is a, a, an example of how uh, this one-legged jerboa might do a leap. So you know, the leg comes down, and then uh, the leg leaves the ground, and then uh, finally it's airborne. And you can have different kinds of leaps. So here's that platform. And uh, here it is. It's trying to do this leap, and it's failing miserably. So um, one thing that we got from this abstraction which is interesting, is that let us, let's just organize the different uh, dynamical uh, uh, equations of motion that you get. And by kind of chaining together the, you know, the hybrid, it's essentially the hybrid system because each of the contact cells has a different set of equations of motion. There's a reset and a guard for transitions between them. And you can actually use this formalism to some extent to get, get so we, we were able to get a proof that this, this monopedal model um, cannot do a rid cannot do a level leap, so it can't spin its rigid leg in a, in such a way such that the robot will be off the ground um, at some uh, sufficient height, um, as well as the pitch will be zero. So it's impossible. So we were able to prove this, which is um, typically this kind of proof is very difficult, but um, some of this formalism were, was very helpful in organizing this kind of proof. Um, so now what we've done is obviously, since we know that that's impossible, we changed the design. Um, instead of having a rigid leg, we added a compliant leg, which I won't go, to go into the details of what changes that um, uh, induces. But you can see that now you can have level leaps. In the, in the second one, the pitch of the body is actually completely you know, reversed in the, middle of the, in the middle of flight. And you can actually get some, some useful behavior instead of kind of hopelessly spinning through the air. Um, the other uh, you know, thing that can add complexity is if you have another limb, obviously. So now we're uh, using the tail as a leg. And uh, here, Jerboa is uh, able to do things like flip itself over. This is, you know, if, if, the, if the robot has a top and a bottom, you, you can imagine needing to kind of dynamically reorient. And uh, obviously, that's possible. Um, you can also uh, do things like a leap on top of boxes, uh, ledge ascent. Um, it's almost the height of a stair. It's only uh, you know, a little bit. Uh, away from it, but you know this robot could climb stairs hypothetically, um, and and also cross gaps. So this is all uh, with uh, with very very simple control strategies of just um, uh, essentially applying maximum torque or voltage to the motors um, in in a in a way that's parameterized by the kind of time of activation. Uh, and lastly, we add more complexity by now uh, replacing the rigid leg with the compliant leg and also uh, allowing a second step. And this was uh, what I showed you before. And uh, now we can get dramatically better behavior. So you can cross a ledge that's almost two times the body length and uh, jump up a ledge that's um, 1.6 times the hip height. So yeah, this could certainly climb a stair, even though we didn't really try that on stairs. OK, so, so to get back to the question that motivated this, when, when, is Jerboa and Rex, when are Jerboa and Rex going to leap the same? 
Um, so we looked at the, the ground reaction complex and the paths taken through them for some of the leaves on both the robots, including the one that that picture is of. Um, and we kind of identified that there are some leaps that Jerbo can't do. So, so, so the, these gray paths that Rex can uh, leap through, uh, Jerbo can't attain them because of things like kinematic limits. So the tail, uh, for instance, uh, is much longer than the leg. And you can see that that might introduce some workspace constraints, and that kind of takes away some of the leaps that are possible. But for the leaps that are um, that both robots can do, there's a you know some kind of correspondence between them. So what we did was we took leaping data, um, and and the green and the yellow parts are the ones that I want to focus on. And this is all kind of data driven. So there's uh, the we're only starting to think about formal understanding of these things. But you can see that these uh, green and yellow leaps, um, firstly, um, there's a discontinuity of the transition for a lot of the states. So the, the red one kind of, you can see that the, there's a big jump there for both Rex and Jerboa. And within, and within each of these uh, uh, leap windows, the trends for both of the robots are very similar. Um, so what does this tell us? It basically tells us that for the leaps that are um, similar, the continuous dynamics within uh, all of the, the, the contact mode that it's going through are kind of similar for both the robots. And it's also telling us that there's a drastic difference when you go from one leap to another. So all of these are uh, useful to know. So for instance, if you wanted uh, to target a specific um, apex state, um, you, 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 would, you might want to pick uh, the correct parameter on this x-axis such that you get um, close to uh, uh, the right apex state and also avoid regions of high sensitivity. So I wouldn't want to pick this word or this region here just because there's a, you know, a discontinuity in the, that region, for instance, of the parameter space. Um, okay, so I'll conclude now. Um, so mostly uh, what I talked about is abstraction, um, how to think about behaviors as being composed of simpler things in, in a number of different ways. Um, and the, the, the message is that abstraction might be useful. Um, so here's a kind of a, a childish example. But so uh, on the left, there's someone writing a bubble sort program in assembly. And on the right is a, and, and obviously that's not complete. It's much longer. Um, and the, on the right is an example of the same algorithm in C. And you can see that it's much shorter, it's much cleaner, um, easier to maintain. But maybe the assembly one performs better. Who knows? Um, but the thing is, in programming, we've done this. We've made this trade-off to go to higher level languages just because the abstraction is useful. We don't want to worry about which register has which variable at which time. We'd rather just let the, you know, the compiler deal with that in a specific way. Um, and, and, and we choose the abstraction even though we don't know that we're getting the maximum possible performance. So maybe there's a similar analogy for robots. Um, the second takeaway is that um, we can synthesize complicated behaviors from template behaviors. Um, so we shouldn't think about the robot as being a kind of an immutable body. You can change how the minotaur is moving just because you can change what templates are embedded within it. Um, and and uh, so, so this idea of building up behaviors is different from optimization. Um, optimization is usually, you know, you take, you, I would take the whole system and kind of run it through an optimizing algorithm and see what behavior comes out. But, but, but the problem with that is that it's not generative. So I can't learn something from optimization and use it for a slightly different problem, whereas that's mostly what I showed you before in this talk where we were you know, developing a vertical hopping controller and, and using it for several different um, instances of behaviors and even instances of robots. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll end here. I'm sort of discussing my future work, which is possibly present work now. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any last questions? All right, thanks. <laughs>